Casey. Hi, Drew. How are you? All right. How are you? Good. Thank you. I'm here so, if you need me. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I guess you'll just keep track of things that are in the chat. I mean, this will this will be fairly straightforward. Yeah. Just uh, holler if you need something. But yes, I'll, I'll uh, keep track of that for you. Cool. Thank you. Uh-huh. You bet. Yeah. Ooh. You hanging in there? Yeah, it's been a long day. <laughs> I know it's uh, it's just so much to take in. It's so beautiful and good and yeah, interesting. It's but it's a lot of information. <laughs> a lot of information, yeah. <laughs> and we're moving fast. It feels like it. Mm -hmm. So you're in Beaumont. I mean, you you work with Amy, right? Yeah, yeah. I grew up in Texas. I haven't been back in decades. I, I grew up in Austin. There's not much to come back for right now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess yeah. it's still a beautiful place. I, I loved Austin. Austin is such a beautiful city. Yeah, but, my parents live in Lago Vista on the lake. It's oh, lovely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really pretty. And I love San Antonio and I've never actually been too much in your in your corner of Texas. I haven't been there much. I, I remember going to Houston once as a child, um, but really we mainly stayed central. Yeah. Yeah. This this side of Texas has its own beauties and its own, you know, <laughs> um, sort of uh, interesting uh, dynamics, but uh, yeah. I, I grew up here. I lived in central Texas for about 10 years and then I came back yeah here so <laughs> yeah there's something maybe it's just home yeah 
I was, people are always surprised when I tell them how green and hilly Central Texas is. They're, yeah. they, I think they expect tumbleweeds and cacti. <laughs> when, <laughs> which is fair. Yeah, which I mean, it's parts fair. of it are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Let's see. There's Ben. Hi, Drew. Hi, everybody. Hi. Drew, I'm going to make you and all the panelists co-hosts. Co-hosts, that sounds so good. So that your sweet faces move to the <laughs> very top of the screen. I'm just letting people in too. It's like playing ping pong a little bit. Yeah, no, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but I will get it done. If you want to make me a co-host, I can help with that too. Oh, Mitchell, you are, hi. Amy. You're a co-host. Oh, goody. Okay. All right. Oh, goody. <laughs> All right. Hi, Ben. Hi, Drew. And good to Hi. see you. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry, I had my I didn't have my glasses on, and I just saw um, Furious waving out of the corner of my eye. While <laughs> You're I was like, who is that? Programs. Yeah, I just <laughs> saw it. First? I have all the worst right. eyesight in the world, so all I could see was a vague outline of someone vaguely familiar to me. That's really funny. Yeah, because. <laughs> I was on I was on a, my web browser, so I actually wasn't looking at who was here. And then I came back, and I think you had papers in front of your face, yeah, so yes. I didn't know. But I saw your name, and I was like, "Oh, Mitchell, he's here." Hey, nice wolf ben hat Leonard. behind you there, Mitchell. <laughs> Sorry, I see you have a very nice wolf hat behind you. Oh, oh yeah, I do actually. Very nice, very nice. Yeah, very good. <laughs> I forgot very it was good. there. Ben, none of you had stuff to share. Like none of you had links or anything this is just a round table right so you know yeah we don't have talks in. we'll okay. yeah we don't have okay. talks we're, we're more interested in what anything, other people so. want to know yeah yeah that's what well, I, figured. I think we'll all uh and and sent around a suggestion of, of how we could do it and we'll each have a sort, sort of an opening few minutes of initial advice or introduction to our own journal or something and then yeah. just to give a sense of of so people know who they're talking to uh, oh, I just sent you a text, a message five seconds ago. Okay. <laughs> Gwen, I, I, I just wrote to you, I said, you should come to this panel. And here you are. <laughs> yeah, this is this is right up my alley. This is what okay. I had in your mark for this time. <laughs> here, so yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Great. I wrote back to you, Gwen, so I'll send you something later. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I will probably have some, some links, Drew, but they're links to like the actual website for work okay. studies annual and stuff like that so it's okay. not, so nothing not, not yeah. links to like a access copy or anything like that it's and for now <laughs> hello friend hey i see the stained glass it's amazing how do you like them yeah john's getting good well he made these a while ago he's he's been good he's really good yeah yeah beautiful do you see them on Instagram? Is that how you see them? No, I see them right behind you. Oh, I thought you, I thought you also saw them online. Yeah, he's Sometimes always posting. I do, but yeah. what was my name before? You changed my name. That was so clever. Just added panelists. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. I tried not Thanks, to change Amy. your uh, your writing. I just added panelists. <laughs> That's fine. Thanks, Casey. I, <laughs> I like that panelist is like one of your pronouns. Right. She her panelist. She's her panelist. Yeah. Panelist. I prefer panelist. Feel yeah. free to edit me. I am. Um, I saw on Twitter yesterday someone was at a Zoom and everyone on the Zoom's name had gotten changed to Steven. <laughs> and there was some weird glitch in the Zoom. And oh, it was a huge like a press conference and everyone was Steven and they couldn't they would have to have restarted the zoom to fix it. And so they just said it like it just devolved into just just total hilarity. <laughs> Great. Oh. Oh, the, the, oh, I'm sure she's coming. The itinerary you sent around Anne looked good to me, by the way. I don't know if I actually said that or not, but yeah, <laughs> looks great. 
Great, good. And I see the letters of Virginia Woolf behind you. Also, I see diaries too, don't I? Yeah, it's essays, yeah. letters, diaries, diaries. Cambridge, first yes. editions. It's yep. the whole. All looks familiar. <laughs> There's Melissa. There's Melissa. I'm going to wait just another minute or two before we start. A few people are probably regrouping. It's been a long day. And they might not have seen there was a micro break, not a full. Right. Yeah. So Amy, th Amy throwing a curveball at us after the plenary here. I'm teasing. You're doing a great job. <laughs> doing super, super well. Don't harass her. Yeah, not... tre tread lightly, Ben. Tread Sh lightly. Sh Shiloh would say I'm bullying her, so I should not be doing that. I apologize. <laughs> okay. We are recording, aren't we? Yeah. Okay. Oh no, that's on the recording. That's on the recording. Your, oh. your verbal harassment of the. Uh, oh well, it's on the, the record. Now. I'll edit out record. your meanness. <laughs> oh, thank you, Casey. Welcome. Right. What's your Venmo? I'll send you some cash. Dollar <laughs> fifty. <laughs> All right. Good. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everybody to a roundtable on publishing a scholarly article, and I'm very happy that three friends of mine are the fabulous panelists today. Um, let me go ahead and introduce all three of them first. Uh, that way they can take it away and do their roundtable thing and we will have time for questions at the end. So we'll start off with Benjamin Hagen, who teaches at the University of South Dakota. He is the editor of Wolf Studies Annual and author of The Sensuous Pedagogies of Virginia Woolf and D.H. Lawrence from Clemson in 2020, which is niftily on sale in a couple of days, as you'll see in the uh, form that Amy Smith sent around a little while ago. Uh, his research has appeared or is forthcoming in the journals Age, Culture, Humanities, Comparative Critical Studies, Modernism, Modernity, PMLA, 20th Century Literature, and Virginia Woolf Miscellany, as well as in book collections focused on Virginia Woolf, the Bloomsbury Group, and Louise DeSalvo. He is at work on a new monograph, Finding Love in Literary Studies, and he is currently, perhaps you've heard of this, the president of the International Virginia Woolf Society. And we also have Anne Fernald, who is a professor of English and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Fordham University. She is the editor of the Cambridge University Press, Mrs. Dalloway from 2014, the Norton Critical Edition of Mrs. Dalloway from 2021, and the Oxford Handbook of Virginia Woolf 2021, which I am diving into soon. It is right next to me at my left elbow. She is the co-editor of Modern Modernism, Modernity, and one of the editors of the Norton Reader, a widely used anthology of essays. She is the author of Virginia Woolf, Feminism and the Reader, 2006, as well as articles and reviews on Woolf and feminist modernism. She occasionally updates her blog, Furnum, and can be found on Twitter, Twitter at Furnum. We also have Melissa Bradshaw, who is a senior lecturer in English at Loyola University, Chicago. Her research focuses on the cultural rhetorics that inform our understanding of powerful public women. She has published extensively on the American poet Amy Lowell, co-editing a volume of her poems, as well as a volume of scholarly essays about her. Her book, Amy Lowell, Diva Poet, Ashgate 2011, won the 2011 MLA Book Prize for Independent Scholars. She is currently working on both a selected letters of Amy Lowell, the Amy Lowell Letters Project, a critical digital edition of Lowell's co collected letters for which she was awarded an NEH Mellon Foundation Fellowship for Digital Publication, as well as a monograph on celebrity poets and ephemera. She is an associate editor and outgoing book review editor for Feminist Modernist Studies, for which she has co-edited the first of two special issues on feminism and modern dance. The second will be published later this summer. So there are our distinguished panelists, and they are going to take it from here. It's yours. Thanks, Drew. Thank you, Drew. Thank you so much. So, um, so we decided to sort of break up just the opening bit of this roundtable. We'll each spend, spend just a few minutes saying something specific about our experience working with uh, the particular publications we uh, have experience working with. Uh, and then we might talk to each other for a little while after the three of us have a uh, sort of go through that first cycle. 
But really, I think we were more interested in what you want to know uh, about publishing uh, an, uh, a scholarly art article. So we hope that most of the time can actually be dedicated to, to you. Um, so uh, I, I have seen, and this is a bit daunting to say, put into words, I have seen one volume of Wolf Studies Annual through to publication, um, to, to completion. Um, Mark Hussey saw 27 volumes through uh, to completion. So there's a way in which I sort of feel like maybe Mark should be here instead of me to, to sort of uh, talk this through. But um, in my time, I just, since I have seen at least one volume, I think I have a few things to maybe say, um, specifically about what it means to, uh, to, to try to publish with, an, uh, with a journal that's as focused as Wolf Studies Annual. And by focused, I mean, it's a single author journal, which is not to say we don't also publish work dedicated to authors or figures or discourses that are, are Wolf or Bloomsbury adjacent. But for the most part, yeah, you know, I think I think we could probably all agree that the the focus of Wolf Studies Annual is a bit narrower than the journals of my two that, that my two colleagues uh, work with. Um, so one thing that comes with that is an expectation, and I'm going to actually put a link in the chat to the submission guidelines for WSA. Um, with that is, is that, you know, when I get a submission, I'm expecting, you know, the first thing I do, aside from read the abstract, hopefully there is an abstract attached to the submission, um, there better be, uh, is, is I, I do a very sort of practical thing, which is I scroll to the works cited page. And I, I have a look because one of the submission criteria um, or part of the submission criteria is a familiarity that, that the author should have a familiarity with the journal and the work that's been published in the journal. Um, and so it's not, that's not to say that if I don't see articles published in Wolf Studies Annual in the work cited that I desk reject it, but it, it does ra raise a concern. And I start sort of thinking about, okay, how, how is this author um, piecing, piecing together and situating their work in Wolf Studies? Um, often it's the case the person has done a lot of homework in the discourse of the particular history or material history or cultural history they're situating Wolf in. So there's a lot of homework that's been done there. But um, even just one year in, I received quite a few submissions that um, say, uh, I'm just making this up at the moment, but say about to the lighthouse. Um, but the actual Wolf scholarship cited there say comes from a Cambridge companion, which is a great resource, but is not but I think gives something away about how a lot, there's still a lot of homework that needs to be done about reading to the lighthouse, even if that scholarship doesn't directly engage with the discourse, the particular discourse um, that the, the person's writing about. So, so I think that's, that might seem basic, but I've seen it enough that maybe it's worth saying that if you're interested in say, submitting something to Wolf Studies Annual, that that's, that having some familiarity with the stuff that already has been published there, but also familiarity with scholarship about whatever particular novel you're writing about um, says and how what that says impacts how you're interpreting that particular novel within a new, a new context. I, I think we sort of need to see it. And that's important because I know that's what the readers are gonna say. You know, that's probably also one of the most common comments I have from a reader in reader reports in the past year is if something gets past me and I don't see it, the report comes back and set, is often a bibliography, right, of things that the person should take a look at. So that's all I'll say for now. I certainly have a lot more to say. We all have a lot to say about this, but I thought just in terms of the context of a single author journal, um, that is the number one thing I see and the number one problem that means something doesn't get past me or the number one thing I see come back from reader reader reports so great okay so I guess I'll just chime in I'm in my third of four years as co-editor-in-chief of modernism modernity which is a very different journal than Wolf Studies Annual right I mean it is the flagship journal for the field of modernist studies um, and so the bar for getting into the journal is really, really high. And so I want to talk a little bit about what the journal is, how it's edited, because it's quite unusual and kind of what the pieces of the journal are. Um, 
and then how to frame, give you some advice on how to frame an article for submission, and then talk a little bit about the kinds of things that we publish that aren't journal articles, right? Because especially if you're an early career researcher, there are a lot of options before an article in the print journal in the Modernism Modernity platform. And Modernism Modernity is very, it's, it's an interesting balance to tread for me personally, for the journal. I know I share this with my co-editors and with Deborah Ray Cohen, whom I succeeded, which is kind of how do you maintain the incredibly high standard of articles for modernism and modernity while also providing a ladder for people to get to the place where their scholarship is um, that good. Right. And so I have to say no to a lot of people. I reject a lot of articles. It's really painful for me, but it's also part of a mentoring process. Right. And so it's always about this isn't there yet. It isn't. And that's that's that. Right. And that's that's a final decision. But that's but the yet is an important part of that. This isn't there yet. Right. So modernism modernity is a quarterly. The co-editors and I, I have a team now, but we, when submissions come in, I'm the, I'm at the moment, the senior co-editor. When submissions come in, I assign either myself or one of my co-editors to find peer reviewers. Then an article goes through peer review. It's mutually anonymous peer review. And so each article is read by two people. Um, Almost everything that gets submitted gets sent out to readers unless it really looks like it's not an article, right? And so because I'm getting things on um, Bulgarian radio in the 30s and how it, right, I, I can't say, oh, this isn't familiar with the discourse of Bulgarian radio, right? And so I have to just say, I'm going to find people who look to me to be able to do this. And when I'm looking for peer reviewers for modernism and modernity, I'm generally looking for two different kinds of peer reviewers, someone who's deep in the discourse that you're in, and then someone who understands the broader field that you're in. So Eastern European modernism, right? So if it's a wolf article, I'm going to look for a wolf reader, maybe someone who's written on Jacob's room because you're writing on Jacob's room. And then because you're talking about World War One, I'm going to send it to a World War One scholar who's not a Wolfian, right? Because this is not Wolf Studies Annual. And the article has to be relevant to modernists more broadly, right? And so one of the things that I want to communicate to you, in, in addition to underscoring everything Ben said, is that the, the same article might need a just a slightly different introduction when you recast it for Wolf Studies Annual than when you recast it for Modernism and Modernity, right? And so if, if you get rejected from one journal and you're sending it to another journal, what you explain and what you take to be understood changes, right? And so in Modernism and Modernity, you might spend three or four sentences summarizing the plot of Jacob's Room, where in Wolf Studies Annual, you might just do a, a phrase, right? When Jacob's in college, right? Well, no, for modernism and modernity, you might like actually, you know, for part of the novel, Jacobs at Cambridge, you know, right. Um, when you submit an article to modernism and modernity, and this is something that I've learned that I am going to take to heart when I rotate off, the abstract is so important and the title of your article is so important because when I send things out for peer review, that is all the reviewers know. I'm asking you to read an article that's entitled this, I append below the abstract. And if that abstract is phoned in, vague, right? Someone's gonna say, you know what? I don't wanna do it. A lot of times I'll get an email back within the day saying, that sounds so cool and send it along, right? Because the abstract is good. And so my, in, for me as a writer, like when I'm writing the abstract, I'm super tired, I'm fed up, I phone it in, it's not a good look. And I think that's hurt me in my, it's my own personal attempts to publish articles, right? Because I'm, I don't write good abstracts. The abstract really matters. 
for our journal, we allow you to suggest peer reviewers. And we also allow you to prohibit a peer reviewer. For almost all of you, I would expect you don't have anyone you want to prohibit. But in the off chance that you've gotten in a little fight with someone professionally, right? If you have a dissertation committee member who was a jerk to you, you have the right to say, a, no, let's not make it two people, but to say about one person, please don't send my work to that person. That person is not sympathetic to my approach. That person doesn't like me, right? And I, I you know, they were in the audience at the conference. They asked a hostile question, right? I don't, I want your article to be accepted. I want your article to get really good readings. I want people to be engaging with your work on its merits. And even if, you know, the most likely scenario is you get a revise and resubmit and you assess the revisions are greater than I want to do, but I'm going to use those revisions to send it elsewhere, or I'm going to take it on and I'm really going to dig back in. But I want those suggestions not to be hostile, but to be constructive, right? There are lots of different kinds of articles in the world. I'm not going to send something to someone who's theoretically opposed to the approach you're taking. And in fact, peer reviewers have said to me, I am opposed to this theoretical approach. I'm not a good reader for this. And then I just accept that and I find another reader, right? Um, so the abstract really matters. Suggesting people really matters. One of the things that some early career people do when they suggest readers is they're like, I want Ben Hagen, Mark Hussey, and Jillian Beer, right? They just name like the three most famous Wolf Scholars they've ever heard of. As a, you know, you can do that, right? But actually what we want is like, who's the person you're in conversation with? What's the work that you're continuing? Who's someone who's gonna be psyched because they did something on the British Library 10 years ago and you've got a new twist on it that's not hostile to their work, but that's continuing their work, right? So they're gonna feel like, oh, wow, you know, um, I really learned from Gretchen Grazina's work in, and I'm now doing something on Wolf and Windrush that builds on it in ways that are going to make her helpful and that she's going to be able to help me. So she would be a good suggestion, right? And then I can send it to her and she can say I don't have time to read it, but here's someone who might, right? So that's the kind of suggestion that helps me. Um, I'm running out of time, so let me just say, in addition to articles, we have lots of other things on the Print Plus platform. So Modernism Modernity has as a policy that is controversial, but I stand by and am not changing during my tenure, which is you have to have a PhD to review books for us. Okay, so um, you have to have written a book and you have to have you know, written a book length thing to uh, review a book length thing. That's not true universally, but sometimes early career people get their hands on a book length manuscript and they rip it to shreds and actually they haven't had the experience of trying to put together a book length manuscript and the ripping it to shreds is more hostile than helpful right i mean some books need to be uh stopped right if not all books are great but like growth mindset here so but we do allow people to do what we're calling the little reviews, which are capsule reviews, 150 words of books that we've got listed in the books of interest section at the back of each issue. Those are the books we don't have time to review. So we've already decided we're taking a pass on this. It is a book in the field. We're not going to review it. You can write a little 150 word review. We have blogs, lots of blogs. Those are about 3,000 words, informal essays. We really are looking for um, independent scholars, early career researchers, um, people at teaching heavy institutions who don't have a lot of time. That's my timer reminding me to wrap it up to um, do full scale scholarship to write a 3,000 word piece on something. And then we have clusters, which are a set of five, six, seven linked 3,000 word interventions in the field. So blog posts, clusters, capsule reviews. We're also doing this thing 
Um, I'll show you if I'll tip my camera. You see at the top of my bookshelf, my little shelf of Persephone books. So we're doing a thing of um, reviews of reprints of modernist texts. So Chris Ralston just did a review for us of Dorothy Strachey's um, Olivia, which is dedicated to Wolf. It's a lovely little novella. Andre Asiman just brought out the Penguin edition. So it's a pretty, It's so if there's a reprint like a Persephone book or a Penguin or a Virago or anything like that, that you think this would make a good teaching text, or this is a research text that's available, it's newly in print, that's a great thing. And I don't have any restrictions on, you know, you can be any rank to write those things. And that's really to kind of help get the word out about, um, less well-known modernist women writers, right? I mean, one of the things that's been a real mission for me is to make modernism and modernity more open to feminist work and to use the wolf's coattails to bring attention to less well-known modernist women writers. And so the reprint section helps us do that. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions in the Q&A, but I'm going to pass it over to Missy. All right. So if you have feminist uh, essays, we, of course, want them at Feminist Modernist Studies also. So I am uh, in a, again, different position from either Ben or from Anne. I am not, uh, I'm an associate editor at Feminist Modernist Studies, um, but I'm not like the all boots on the ground editor. Um, so what I am here to talk about uh, is the experience of editing a special issue of a journal or edited collections, because that's what, uh, what I've done a lot of work on. But really quickly, just an overview, if you're thinking about submitting to Feminist Modernist Studies, I have, uh, I'm gonna put our information Oh, looks like, yes, okay. Uh, we have a broad mandate. Feminist Modernist Studies goes from 1870 to 1970. And most of the work that we have published, we're um, entering into our sixth year, really has fallen in that middle of what we would, what we would legibly see as modernism. And it's primarily been modernist literature. But I want people to um, keep us in mind when you're on the late Victorian end of things or, you know, the 19, we go up to 1970. So there's a lot of latitude and we really do aim to be an interdisciplinary journal. Certainly the work that I'm doing on these two special dance issues is attempting to be interdisciplinary, which is its own um, uh, uh, Pandora's box of hubris and difficulty because interdisciplinary, I think we know as primarily literature people here that we really mean us as literature people doing whatever we want. Uh, but I really have found the challenges of working with historians and dance historians as I put these uh, volumes together have been um, pretty, pretty formidable. I can talk about that in a second. But I wanted to talk about what does it mean to submit work for a special issue of a journal or to an essay collection? Your relationship to your editor is going to be different than it would be if you're submitting to Anne or to Ben. There is not necessarily going to be a blind peer review process. Sometimes edited collections will, but most likely the, the special editors themselves are the peer reviewers. Now, what this means is that there's a lot of transparency as far as I'm the point person for my special issues. And I'm going to take a very big, uh, intense interest in what you've written. And the kind of mentoring that Anne and Ben have talked about, it's going to be happen, happening at an even thicker level. Now, what this means, what, is the, what this has meant in my life as an author is I have been granted tremendous grace by special collections editors in a way that I might not have been if I was submitting straight to a journal, right, where, where I risked the desk rejection. Uh, I, I think one of my first articles that I published was with Camera Obscura, and I got to work with Alexander Doty. And 
I'm so grateful that that article was published because what I sent him was certainly not what was published a, a couple of years later. Um, because I was working right with him, he could say, mm, there's something here, but you're not here yet. And, and over a, a, the course of a, of a couple of years, he really shepherded that essay in a way that if I had just submitted to Camera Obscura, they probably wouldn't have even sent it out for peer review. I try to think about that when I'm dealing with my authors, particularly because with the, with the dance issues, I'm dealing with a, a marginalized part of humanities, which is itself a marginalized discipline. And I'm very aware that the people who are submitting to me really don't have a lot of venues for their work. That's one of the reasons we wanted to do this for feminist modernist studies, besides that we all need to know about dance. And so I'm working with a lot of early career researchers, um, late stage graduate students, and I, and I feel like I have been gifted this opportunity to learn about their field, but also work closely with them. So my, my advice for, for you, if you're thinking of submitting to edited collections or to a special issue, is be aware that you can ask a lot of, of the editor. You can write them as you're preparing the manuscript, run it by them. If you think you're drifting off topic, let them know, have that conversation because they're going to have a vested interest in, they've got to get X amount of articles that are good for that issue. There's no shuffling it off to the next issue. So they are going to invest in you. So um, check in with them, listen to them, but be humble. Um, I, I give a lot of advice. I, I, I don't want to think that I'm reviewer number two, but you know, let's think about the, the, what it means to be reviewer number two. I don't know anybody who just responds to people's uh, article drafts with, with animosity. You know, we all talk about the legendary reviewer too, who's just mean. I don't really think anybody is just mean or if they are, I'm glad not to have them in my uh, universe. Um, I put a lot of time into my suggestions. They're, they're thoughtful. They're often done in consultation with other researchers in the field. So listen, don't, don't let me put eight hours of work into editing your essay and then just don't do what I asked, right? So that relationship is, is going to be more personal. It's potentially more, um, it, it potentially has more direct things to offer you, but it also should be, um, I don't know what I'm saying, respected. Um, really don't, we've had a few people who, who after a second round took, took, took our articles and submitted them elsewhere, um, which we're going to find out it's a small world. So if I've put all this time into su making suggestions for your article, don't, don't, don't lie to me and tell me that your dean says you can't submit it for 10 years so you're not gonna use it because i'm gonna see when it comes out in the dance version of mla like i'm i'm alive um i'm gonna know so anyway that's that, that's something um don't double dip um we can't afford to lose contributors and you can't afford to make me angry really then you can i'm not that powerful but it's a small world be polite um I have a lot of other things to, uh, to talk about, but I, I want to follow Anne and Ben in um, their being concise. We can open it up to conversations. I have more things to say about what would make me reject an article, but I also don't only want to sound negative, but editing is a little bit negative. I mean, I would just, maybe the three of us can talk a little bit. Sure. Um, before we open it up, I don't know if that's helpful, but I have seen really mean things. Like when yeah. you leave yeah. the world of feminist yeah. modernism, yeah, people can you know it's a nasty world out there. I've I I and I just I don't know just to, to keep myself alive or something. I tend to put the more negative review as reviewer number two. So when I have two reports and one is negative, I make it number two just to make the reviewer number two. But they're, by and large, they're not cruel. I have had one one extraordinarily cruel one and i learned 
that as an editor, I didn't know this, this was when I was very new in the job, that I didn't need to send that whole report. Yeah. Right. Yep. That you can, that as editors, you can just delete the ad hominem attack. It's not helpful. Right. And just had the paragraph that says, you know, you need to engage more with the Foucauldian discourse and more recent scholarship and not say, I can't believe you sent this out for peer review. This is Drek. Right. I mean, just that sentence doesn't need to go to anyone. And so there's a little judicious um, editing. And I definitely have, have occasionally own, very, very rarely overruled peer reviewers. Mm -hmm. And I'll give you two examples of why I've overruled them. Once I overruled someone because it was as if Ben Hagen sent me something and the peer reviewer said, this person doesn't cite Ben Hagen. <laughs> and, you know, of course, because the person had anonymized his submission and right. so he couldn't cite himself. And then he had been so assiduous in anonymizing it that his work didn't appear in the piece and it was going to get back in when it got accepted. So I overruled the peer reviewer because right. I knew that that would sort itself out in the wash. But another time people have said to me, you know, this is a case study of a modernist text and that's not something modernism and modernity does. And I'm like, it's not your job to decide what modernism and modernity does. I'm the editor. I decide that, right? And and modernism and mm -hmm. modernity has always published like theoretical interventions and right. case studies. I mean, there have been case studies in modernism and modernity since the beginning. Beginning. So yeah. it was an inaccurate assessment and like that was the reason for the rejection. Yep. So um, that was a case where I've overruled it. I don't know. Have you overruled p peer reviewers ever, either of you? Or um, I mean, not. I mean, not. I think I have. Within a context, I have like right? if I send that, but like when one reader report comes back and it's a very generous report that may may give critical feedback and suggest a revise and resubmit. And if the other one is just like a few sentences or a paragraph and like, absolutely not, you know, this is, this is terrible. That that's a moment where I think, wow, okay. I'm in a bit of a pickle now. Like neither have it been enthusiastic and said, you know, you should definitely publish this, but one was a long report with a lot of generous feedback that gave a good case for how it could be publishable and of interest to the journal. And the other clearly did not do as much work, was not the reader Missy was talking about who had put the time, time into really giving a fair evaluation. And in those cases, what I often do is I have to find a third reader. You know, that, that's not necessarily me overruling, but it is me trying to get another, like a third perspective um, yes. that, that will help sort of balance out that I will still try to ex I've still try to extract the the bits that may be helpful from the short <laughs> unhelpful report and right. send that along to the author too, um, and then I also try to communicate to the author that um, I am seeking out a, 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 another report because I want to give them an update about the time because I no, I think maybe this is a whole other issue now but the timeline can get sort of obstructed at many different points along you know, the potential publishing route and oh, so many those sorts of moments where you have to sort of think about, okay, do I need to bring someone else in now extends that even further because you have to give that person a fair amount of time to do a report uh, as well. So um, I also, you know, and this was not to say that um, reader reports in WSA were cruel, cruel before, but, you know, some changes I've implemented or, or to sort of include in the uh, evaluative submit like guidelines that I send to readers is to was a paragraph suggesting that they think of this as you know coming back to what Missy said this is this is an opportunity to mentor someone you don't know who this is necessarily but it's highly you know it's possible that this is a person who would tremendously benefit from your expertise uh, and your and mentorship so um, right and I think know. I mean, I think what Missy said is really important for mm -hmm. all of us to hear, whether we're serving as reviewers or we're yeah. submitting articles, right? It is really inconsiderate of your peer reviewers to submit stuff that's sloppy, yep. right? And so, and you will get a bad review. I mean, people will, people a lot, a certain amount of time, say they say, I've got three hours to read this article and write up my report. If part of their three hours that they're paying attention to your work is telling you that you've got typos, 
that's a really big missed opportunity for you. Right. And so get the names right, you know, do all that stuff really like the cleanest of clean mm -hmm. copies before you submit. Um, really matters because then you'll get actual help. You know, I don't know if I'm thinking about like things I wish I'd known. And one of the things I, I get emails all the time from people asking on the status of their articles and modernism and journey has a terrible backlog, a huge backlog. It's like a mm -hmm. two year or three year backlog. I mean, it is real. We are really, really backlogged. Plus COVID right. plus my own like personal challenges with COVID that slowed me down personally plus other people on my team got us slowed down. So I had hoped to draw down the backlog and I've been lucky to tread water. Mm -hmm. It's always okay with me if someone writes and says, what's the status of my piece? Yep. Like that feels like a scary email to write to someone. It's okay to write it. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and we can say it's still under review. You know, I'll nudge, I'll nudge your reader. But the other day someone wrote it to me and I nudged the reader and the reader said, Oh, you caught me at a good time. And he sent me the report and I could render a decision within like right. 72 hours. Yep. Yep. Um, I, I do also want to say, and when you were talking about the different kinds of things, modernism, modernity publishes, I, I also wanted to just jump in and add that, um, WSA has, you know, since the very beginning also published um, archival materials that have never been published before, right? Whether it's a letter someone came across in an archive or a full typescript of something that had not worked its way into uh, something else. Uh, Beth Rodgell Doherty in volume 12 published, I think like a hundred letters uh, of readers who wrote to Wolf about Wolf's, Wolf's work. And that's um, such a great issue. Yeah, Anna Snaven, Volume Six, I think, published right. Um, you know, Three Guineas letters, people writing to Wolf about about Three Guineas, and so there, there is a lot of uh, material other than just say a full length article that WSA is very interested in potentially getting out to people who want to know more about Wolf and Wolf circles, especially angles that sort of illuminate something we might not think about. Um, I think still people assume, you know only a certain cla class or kind of reader Red Wolf and Gretchen was talking about this in her plenary. Well, actually, no, right? If you, you lots of different people were reading Wolf and writing to Wolf. Um, and that that kind of thing is also um, something we're interested in. So if you're doing archival work and, and are thinking about potentially um, putting together something for, for publication on it, I'd be I'd love to talk to you. We're also, I'm also investigating, um, not investigating, but open now, especially during the pandemic to shorter form pieces, mm -hmm. comments, notes, queries. Um, had a great, great piece on Mich uh, Michelle de Montaigne, a short piece on Montaigne and Wolf that came out in the most recent volume of WSA. Um, uh, so anyway, so if you have a, some sort of idea for something you'd like to publish that isn't just a full 8,000, 10,000 word article, absolutely be in touch with me. I'd love to chat with you about if you have an idea regarding that. So. Should we open it up to questions and how do we want to do that? Or do you have Missy, you look like you're about to say something. No, I was going to, I don't, I don't have a experience with um, um, shepherding peer reviews. So I didn't, I didn't have a response to that, but just the relationship to um, secondary sources like I think Amy Smith had said you know I'd like to hear about what makes you why things get rejected and and for me there's there's two things and one is that relationship to your secondary sources um I find uh I, I struggle a lot with authors who either don't acknowledge see themselves as part of a conversation Right. So so they're either not acknowledging, which if you're writing about Amy Wolf, it's always going to come to me. I'm like, I'm one of the only people who writes on her. So you should know that almost always Missy, but Melissa Bradshaw is going to be <laughs> one of your reviewers. And if you're not citing me, I'm going to wonder why, um, because you have to, because that's like the one thing I get from being the only Amy Wolf person is I get to be cited a lot. 
but but it's it's not that sounds egomaniacal, but but I use that no, as a broad right. example. You but you're not book. wrong, right? Yeah, you wrote yeah. the book. It's true. I did. And and but but as a reviewer, it's something I'm as a peer reviewer, it's something I'm very sensitive to. So yeah. you know, every discipline has its own citational system. And those citational systems reflect its values and what matters, yeah. right? So in the social sciences sciences where they're doing APA, then they're gonna shove a million names in a parentheses. That's fine. That's not what's important about what they're citing. What, what's important is that you know that other people have these studies have done this work mm -hmm. and you need to show that you're aware of them. But in the humanities with MLA, with, with Chicago, the value is on bringing the scholarship into yeah. your citational practice. So don't quote somebody and then footnote it and have it down in a footnote. Like you learn to use introductory clauses you know, as so-and-so explains, you know, that's, a, that's something that we do in our field that might not be obvious, but it's, it's, it's important, right? So if, if you're not citing people, if you're citing them cursorily, or the most important no is citing them in order to demean them, right? And that's something that I'm sure all of us see a lot. And it's, it's, it's something we do early in our careers to try and like establish what we're working on is to say, nobody's ever thought of this before. And that's almost never going to be a persuasive reason for you to say anything, right? So like using other scholarship to build your argument, but not to build your argument against, right? Yep. Like, and that's something that as an editor at early stages of your article, I'd be really happy to talk to people about like, right. how are you joining this conversation? What are you doing differently? Um, but anyway, that's, that's a big reason why um, I, uh, a, a big thing that I point out and are, ask people to rethink. Now that's been difficult with the dance issues because I don't know the scholarship. And in that case, I rely on you to bring in your sources, gloss them, and, and help me understand why I need to, to know okay. about it. So, so for interdisciplinary work, you can't take much for granted. And I think that as an editor, we can help pull you back if you're over glossing or over introducing, right? Or we can coax you to put a little bit more in. Oh. Yep. I think that's really helpful. And I think to the question of why things get rejected, no, I'm very, very dependent on peer reviewers. My co-editors are more um, Stephen Ross and Alice Moody. Um, they edited the Bloomsbury Handbook on Global Modernism. And so they tend to assign the peer review, uh, the peer reviews for anything that's not Anglo-American. And I tend to assign the peer reviews for the Anglo-American modernism, right? So that's how we've divided the labor mm -hmm. at that peer review stage, right? But Anglo-American modernism is huge, right? I mean, I assign the reviews for the Faulkner pieces. I haven't read Faulkner since grad school. Yeah. So I'm very, very dependent on peer reviewers. But the framing of the article is really, really important. Yeah. So it's not only that you're citing the right sources in your subfield, but also that you understand, and this is one of the things that's so important about having a conference like this one, right? What's interesting people right now? And how is your article related to that? And that can be, and I mean, here's where, you know, sometimes I, I go back to the old Wayne Booth thing about conversations, right? It's okay to say no one's talking about form anymore. And that's why I want to talk about form or everyone's talking about climate change right now and that's why i'm talking about climate change like either either move is okay but you have to make that move at the beginning of the piece to say there's a lot of conversation about this or we've forgotten in our enthusiasm for x this other thing that's also really important right, right. and framing that whether it's in the context of feminist modernist studies so saying you know feminist modernist studies has paid insufficient attention to trans issues or insufficient attention to race or insufficient attention to mm -hmm. e economics, right? Or modern studies has paid insufficient attention to feminism, right? right. So for my journal, like saying, oh, women matter still counts, unfortunately. 
right? I mean, that's one of the reasons why I decided to co-edit co it is because I was so angry that the, the flagship journal in my field, broadly defined, was hostile. I saw it as hostile to my, right. my work. I mean, I've never published an article in Modernism and Modernity, but I'm the editor. Boom. Boom. <laughs> um, Should we, That's a Mitch, great question. Does everybody see the question? Yeah. Mitchell's yeah. question is really, Mitchell's, Mitchell, sorry, I Mitch Mitchell's question you. is good. Mitchell's yeah. question. Mitchell, do you want to go ahead and ask it or do you want me to read it? I mean, everybody can read it. But Mitchell, why don't you go ahead? Just how mm -hmm. crucial is formal academic affiliation? You know, yeah, I'm just I, I'm just asking the question because um, I'm many years out of graduate school, um, but still very obviously very dedicated and invested in the field. And I just wanted to know, you know, as somebody who is not formally enrolled or even affiliated with the university at this moment, um, you know, how encouraged or discouraged should I be about the possibility of ever getting something that I want to write about published in something that is a serious journal mm -hmm. like the ones that you guys edit. Mm -hmm. um, well, make a, any difference. For, it doesn't make, yeah, I mean. Because it's, it's blind work. peer review. It, all, it right. doesn't matter. I mean, if it's good work, it's good work. Yeah. I mean, I think it, 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 it's a good question because it does have to get past people who have affiliations. And if one of us had, say, a bias against people who didn't have that or an article comes from a Gmail account as opposed to a .edu or something, I would understand someone who might be a little nervous about that. But, but yeah, I think all three of us are on the same page about, no, I, you know, if it's coming from a gmail.com account, I, 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 I don't question, you know, is who is this person? I look at the abstract. If it looks interesting, I ask for the, the piece. And, you know, if I scan it through, this it goes through the same process and it goes out, you know, I think, and if we want these journals to keep going, if we if we didn't feel that way, I think we would have to change our tune because we all know, I think, that a far greater number of articles appearing in WSA, in Modernism, Modernity, probably in Feminist Modernist Studies too, are being written by people who might not have, right? Even instructor positions or like, you know, non-tenure track full-time might not have full-time positions or affiliations. Exactly, so, yeah. that's exactly right. So the article itself, submit it send it um what matters is your engagement with the field um i still for peer reviewers only use people with academic affiliations but part of the reason i do that is peer review is service to the profession it's uncompensated labor mm -hmm. so writing the article is uncompensated labor right but you're doing that because you have something to say Peer review is uncompensated labor that, I mean, forgive me, but it's not a pleasure, right? It, it's something we do because we value the continuation of the field. And so I wanna focus on asking people to do that who have full-time salary jobs, because I'm hoping that they're compensated in other ways and they can give me those three, four hours, right? Um, Part-time work is a professional affiliation. No, that's yeah. absolutely right. Mm -hmm. right. Um, Amy has a question for me that I'll answer quickly before Ollie. Is that okay? Um, how has modernism and modernity changed in recent years? I think it's changed for the good, right? Since um, Anne uh, Artist um, came on, right? That's going back a ways now. But really with Deborah Ray Cohen and the invention of Print Plus. Right, which was uh, the online peer reviewed platform, which was intended to draw down the backlog, but has opened up a whole bunch of things, including these blogs that are, I mean, blog is not quite the right term, but they're very serious, short interventions that are really, really powerful and really help early career researchers get a good publication that is open access, right? And then we actually, those blogs aren't peer reviewed, but the we publish a lot of peer reviewed content, including the clusters and the articles. Yep. Um, and Deborah Ray and now me means that we've had a good 15 years of feminists editing the journal. Um, and so that has helped. Uh, move the 
very, very large ocean liner a little bit away from the anti-feminism of its early days, right? I mean, I really think it was pretty hostile to women and feminist issues in the early years of the journal. Um, and that is no longer the case. Um, and I think that the practice of having the editorship rotate so this is pretty new but having people do it for four years with these kind of interlocking four-year terms so that you know you come in and you're junior for two years and then you're senior for two years and there's another person who's junior for two years and senior for two years so there's this kind of always this overlap i think that um is really important because it's an incredibly hard job i'm totally overwhelmed by it as you can probably hear and tell but um it's four years, right? And so then I'm, I'm not going to, like, it's not going to calcify on my watch. It remains pretty vital. Ali? Ali? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, first of all, thank you, everyone, for all of this advice. It's hugely, hugely useful and appreciated, um, especially for someone who's quite early in their academic career. Um, this is really a question for Ben, I guess. Um, you mentioned... Um, that you will look at the work cited to see like um like where the wsa has been has, has been brought into a, a, a submission um i was just wondering how important is it for the specific papers or volumes from the from, from the wsa being referenced how important is it for those to be very recent is it oh. is it do, do you know yeah yeah Sorry, I think I cut you off. I thought I, I didn't see the recentness item coming in. Uh, you're, the, the question is, how is it important? Is it that it, they be like very recent volumes of WSA? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, well, for, to, one clarification is it's it, it's not so much like a automatic desk rejection if I don't see an article from WSA. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's just a curiosity. Like, I'm just like, hmm, that's interesting. You know, that being sent to WSA and there's not an article because great and foundational wolf articles have been published in 20th century literature, modernism, and modernity, modern fiction studies, the journal of modern literature, not to mention journals like PMLA, you know, poetics today, critical inquiry, you know, so there's some, as we all know, a mountain of stuff, right? And so it, it's very possible, a fantastic article I'm super excited about does not cite an article from wolf studies annual. But it is a curiosity and it makes me pay attention and I go back through and wonder, you know, what's going on here. Um, to be honest, to be honest, I'm a little more excited when I see articles from early volumes of Wolf, of Wolf Studies Annual being cited as opposed to very recent ones. Um, that, that, that does not mean I value one or the other in terms of my opinion of the piece, but what it does mean to me is someone has started thinking about, you know, what, um, writers like Lisa Lowe, who's publishing in, in the first 10 volumes of, of WSA, what she's saying about, say, John Milton and Wolf, right, in a, P, in a submission that's about Wolf and John Milton. If I don't see, coming back to Miss Missy's comment, if I don't see Lisa Lowe cited, I'm going to be from those early volumes and be like, hey, look, you know, it's a, there's that. Um, I don't think recentness is really the issue for me. It, it really is more about the content of what was written about, its relevance for the abstract I'm seeing and that sort of thing. So I hope that makes sense. I mean, certainly, yeah. certainly though, if an article came out in volume 28 on the Wolf in the History of Science and you're sending me something on Wolf and Science, I'm gonna be like, hey, I know you probably have not had a chance to read this article and I will be honest with you, but I'm gonna send it to you, right? Cause, and, and I will want you to cite it in your piece. So, so that, so that I will do as an editor, I will do that sort of thing. Cause I want, if I like, you know, if I'm excited by your piece, I want it to be as up to date, so to speak, as it possibly can be. So, which I know can sometimes be frustrating for the author cause they put so much work into it, but yeah. Recentness really does matter to me. Right. I get a lot of pieces that are like, um, modernism as Hugh Kenner told us. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Touche. Touche. Yeah, and absolutely. I feel yeah. like, mm -hmm, you know, with the, the, the things have been written since then. And, 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 right. and, and to be really fair, and this is a conversation that Stephen and Alice and I have had, a lot of times those are submissions from international scholars who are working with a pretty um, poor library. Right. And we've been trying to figure out what are the ways to mentor those people. 
Um, sometimes that's a, that's a desk reject, but it's a desk reject with a kind of invitation to study print plus because that's all open access i mean that's another reason why print plus is so valuable right. is that every article we have on print plus is open access so if you have a library your library doesn't have to subscribe to the journal you can just get on the internet and read those articles and get a sense of what we're doing and kind of um regulate your art your submission to be more in line with the kind of stuff we do Right. And that's, I think, uh, my version of what Ben is saying of like, have you never published, have you never cited Wolf Studies Annual, which suggests to me, you want to be in this journal that you don't know enough about. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Now, where I find myself um, mentoring people with, with, with citing other work is, is um, when they let it do the arguing for them. So this is this yes. is a reason why I might reject an article, but more likely it's it, if it's an article I'm invested in, it's a place where I'm going to ask and, and try to help the author rethink their relationship to that work. So don't let your argument be a quotation from someone else. Don't let them have that. They don't, you know, summarize whatever. But this is about your argument. Mm -hmm. um, for the love of all that's holy don't use block quotes nobody <laughs> nobody wants to read it's painful but it's yeah, so yeah, painful yeah. i i i feel like i i don't know if i've read block quotes very closely ever like I, it, for me it's permission to take a quick eye nap till you get back to the part of the article that tells you what is important about that block quotation right um dropping a lot of information down in somebody else's word and then making me do the work of going back up to that quotation to see where your point works. No, unpack it, fold it into your prose and let it strengthen your argument. It, mm -hmm. You know, some of the things that I end up telling my authors are the same things I tell my, my first year writing students. And I don't mean that condescendingly at all because the principles of good writing are the principles of good writing. And if you've done a, a graduate work, you, you've, you've taught at some point and you have a sense of this. So be ask yourself the kinds of questions you would ask your students. Like, what is my argument? How am I structuring this? What work is this paragraph doing, right? I find myself writing that on, on my author's things. I, I don't know why I'm in this paragraph. So, so, so uh, yeah, that's important. Topic sentences are still really great. I think any yeah any of us who have spent time in, yeah in writing groups with very good writers I think yeah. Missy we all know that like <laughs> often the advice we tell each other you know is where's the topic sentence like what are you doing here right this yeah it, that those don't go away just because we're a few you know we're out of grad school or something yeah Amy you have a question yeah Missy I wonder if you could talk a little about um, more about feminist modernist studies and when you were talking about it going to the 1970s, you know, and starting with like sort of late Victorian stuff. Um, how, I'm wondering about things that are included that are not typically thought of as modernism, like how open is the journal to those kinds of things? When I think about like, oh, I wonder if it would be appropriate to submit something like this, you know, and I think, well, one of those authors is a modernist and the other one thinks of herself as clearly not being a modernist, but, so I'm, again, I don't have the, because I'm not the actual editor of the journal, um, I can't speak for Cassandra, um, but I think that by making it so broad, the 1870 to 1970, that was uh, her invitation to people to define modernism loosely. So certainly in my um, dance issues, I, you know, I've had an article about sketches on napkins, um, I have articles about performance pieces. Like we, we really, I, I personally in my life have very little use for the word modernism. I think it's hurt our field way more than it's helped it at all. So I, I think um, my answer is not, it's not important. I don't think it's important. And my, my sense of the, the peer reviewers that, 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 
the Cassandra and now Aaron Kingsley, who's been managing editor recently, the, the, the group of peer reviewers that they're sending them out to is, is really rich and really broad and interdisciplinary. So I do think that there is, is room for that. And if there's a desk rejection, I also think there's room for, a, for a, a response, asking questions, you know, is, is, is there a better journal or is there a special issue coming up where this might fit better? Right. Um, and I'm, I don't care about the word modernism either, yeah. even though it's like twice in my journal title. Like, you know, I mean, if you look at the table of contents for the most recent issue, we have Hart Crane, George Oppen, Kafka, Chekhov, a German um, entomologist, Sylvia Plath, sodomy in India, and Kipling, right? That's not a list of modernists. That's a list of eight interesting things that were happening kind of around the first half of the 20th century. So don't take yourself out of the game because you think, I mean, for Wolf Studies Annual, it probably should be Wolf adjacent, right? But for feminist, and for feminist modernist studies, it should, it should be feminist. Be. Right. For modernism and modernity, it doesn't even have to be feminist. I mean, I want it to be feminist yeah. because I'm me, but like, you know, there's no feminist article in the issue I just finished editing, right? I mean, to my disappointment, but that's just how it felt. That's how it shook out. As editors, we are deeply invested in this field. We put, we've built our entire lives around modernism, but as with English literature in general, it's dying. You know, there isn't the institutional support for it. So I think journals are a place where we have an opportunity to expand what we mean by these terms and expand what the field looks like and expand who can write in the field to get back to, to, to Mitchell's like that. That's our opportunity. That's something I, I want to do. And I, I think my co-editors share that. This is how we're going to save it. We have to rethink it. We have to open it, be capacious and creative. I, I think the version of uh, of this for Wolf Studies Annual is I, th I think there's maybe some concern that the partly because of how Wolf is talked about at conferences like this or or this like Wolf is a beloved writer in many ways, um, but even though this is an author focused journal, that doesn't mean that every article has to be written in sort of an affirmative spirit about Virginia Woolf, right? Um, you know, I certainly am open to and would invite <laughs> write articles that actually. Um, I wouldn't say are hostile, but that that do sort of a, a deep critique because there's a lot to critique about Wolf and Wolf circles, and um, you know, as was touched on a little bit in Gretchen's Gretchen's plenary, um, and and there are plenty of readers who will be sympathetic to and will want to see that uh, a platform for that scholarship. So uh, this all to say, maybe Wolf Studies Annual wouldn't be the best place for that, but I certainly would be open to having a conversation with authors who aren't interested in just celebrating the genius that Wolf is or something like that. And I don't think that's what Wolf Studies Annual does anyway, but, uh, but, if, but if that's a concern like that, that's certainly not the mission of Wolf Studies Annual to somehow secure the legacy of Wolf. Although in some sense, it also is that. So I think it's hard, not to, it's hard to get away from that as well. So it is a canon focused journal after all. I keep thinking about this, this piece I read in PMLA a couple of years ago, and it was about Edna St. Vincent Millay's World War, one of her World War II volumes. It, and it was about uh, the, the author had a habit of, of going into used bookstores and looking for copies of this book and looking for the ephemera tucked in the pages. Does anybody remember that article? Oh, it was so good. Like that to me is, is this exciting scholarship that right. isn't literal about the literary. Right. I, and I, right. just, ah, I, I just love, I wrote a fan, I tried to write a fan letter to the person, but I, I couldn't find there. They had changed institutions, so. Are there, there are other, other yeah, other questions? Um, there's a question about how to help scholars in places where it's difficult to get research materials. I know that feminist modernist studies has, um, or actually feminist intermodernist studies association, which is the sponsoring group for feminist modernist studies. They are putting together, um, they're very interested in putting together workshops, um, uh, mentoring workshops for 
you know, the parent experience scholar with a less experienced scholar. They also, I, I know, are interested in um, resource sharing. But I would say academic Twitter is a great place for resource sharing, right, Drew? You, you've seen this where, where somebody will say, can you help me find this? And, and people will help you, right? People who have access to JSTOR kind of have an obligation to help people get those articles out from behind the paywall. Right. I think the space between also does a lot of um, trying to match scholars. The Council for Editors of Learned Journals has been doing a lot of mentoring and Janine Utel is the current president of Modernist Studies Association and she's now working at MLA. She's left Widener and she's at MLA and she's very interested in mentoring events. Right. And so I think professional organizations are really trying to pick up the slack where institutions are failing us right and and that's a i mean it's it's not a welcome sign but it's a hopeful sign right and so i think i would encourage if you have as you talk to international scholars encourage them to find out and a lot of these organizations will find ways to decrease a membership fee or waive a membership fee for someone who's international right or they're with modern studies association there's a lot of reciprocal memberships so if you're a member of the east asian modern studies association you have access to some msa stuff right so um i think that's that's a good uh that and twitter are good places to begin mm -hmm. right and networking at conferences right i mean making a friend because you know, Missy and I are friends in real life and text each other all the time. And when you have friends in real life, it's it doesn't feel nearly as scary to text someone and say, does your library have this database? Can you look something up for me? Right. Where you send it out into Twitter. You, it It's intimidating. Right. And so, you know, anything you can do to make those friendships so that then you can um, ask the favors and it just feels with everything as fraught as it is these right. days it just feels really important to kind of con continue that tradition of you know some is dot um and really yeah yeah right that's right i have no problem sending a pdf to someone who doesn't have access to it right i mean i am proud that my library subscribes to some stuff mm -hmm. right but that doesn't mean it's it's locked behind right so. Uh, yeah, I have the absolute silliest question about modernism modernity. I'm just not sure I understand like what's going on between the regular format and print plus. Sure. Like if you submitted what if it would be uh, sent to one stream or the other automatically or why you would select one or the other, even, um, you know, was one more prestigious than the other like it's just a bit confusing. Yeah, no, to me. It's a great question, Gwen, and 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 you're not alone in wondering. Um, that so modernism and learning comes out quarterly um every issue has so i'm going to start like at zero and then move to more advanced stuff so i'm telling you stuff that i know you already know it's a quarterly eight articles per issue every new issue tr um triggers the beginning of a new cycle on print plus so we call it a cycle not an issue right and so the minute you get the print issue of modernism and modernity in your inbox around that time within a week there'll be a letter from the editor on the print plus website and that'll be the initiation of a new cycle every new cycle begins with a letter from the editor the table of contents a teaser article and a teaser review the teaser article and teaser review are the only things that are published in both places that creates the link between the print and online. The letter to, from the editor is only online. There is no letter from the editor in the print journal, right? But that has the kind of function of an introduction to the journal and a retrospective on the past cycle online. Then when you go to the website, you'll see exclusive to print plus articles. Right. So when your article gets accepted in modernism and modernity, it, the acceptance is for publication either in print plus 
or in the print journal. And we just decide where it's going to go. And that's an editorial decision. And um, by and large, it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it's indexed. Deborah Ray Cohen did a ton, a ton of work negotiating with MLA to get that peer review label at the top and to get it indexed in the MLA bibliography. And so it should be the same. But we all know that institutions are institutions, right? And every every time I um, accept an article, I would say about 20% of the time, I'll get a note from the author saying, I really need it to be on Print Plus because my institution really values open access scholarship. Or I really need it to be in print because I'm a Luddite or I think print is more prestigious right or I really need it to be in print because I can't get permission to reproduce my images online right or I really need to be on print plus because I have color images and your journal doesn't publish in color right and so those are those are the mo most common cases where someone has a preference I try and honor their preferences people who are jerks about their preferences tend to get booted a little lower down the list in publication. Like, you know, we just didn't have room in November. It looks like it's going to be January. So like a preference that's a genuine preference that's like, that's real, I totally honor it. People who are like, I couldn't possibly be on the print plus platform. I need to be in print. I'm like, huh, that's interesting. Your article doesn't fit for a few more issues, right? So, so don't be a jerk. But that's, and then print plus is the only place that has all that other stuff the blogs, the unusual reviews. One of our blogs is going to have a podcast link to it soon. Like we're really trying to make Print Plus fun. Print Plus has something new every single week. And so every week we publish something on Print Plus. And so just bookmark that website, modernismmodernity.org, and pop by every week. Um, and there'll be, if nothing else, a capsule review, but usually something more. Does that help Gwen? Yeah, that was super helpful. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Other questions? While we're, while we're waiting for that, I thought I would also add one additional detail to the re, uh, re, um, the peer review process for WSA is that in every issue of WSA, when you look at the, the front matter, there's a list of an editorial board, advisory board. Um, as the submission guidelines point out, I think, um, or they should if they don't, uh, I do try as editor, and this is a this is something Mark Mark established, and is probably pretty commonplace uh, at other journals, but I've never worked at other ones, so I don't know. Is that uh, one of your you should probably assume if you're submitting an article that one of the readers is coming from that editorial board. It's a long list. <laughs> it's a long list of people who have published on Wolf and. Um, it's a practice that we try to work in, you know, them into almost every, it doesn't always happen, especially given competing expertises and schedules and stuff that doesn't always happen. But if you want to get a peek at who, who often is peer reviewing for WSA, just look at the, <laughs> the advisory board, right? That, that'll give you a sort of slice of, of, of that. So. That's the same with FMS. I yeah, think there the you go. associate editors and the advisory board are the first. Yeah, that's the first. Yep. Yeah, I get so many submissions that that's not true for us, but certainly editorial board members are first mm -hmm. line. Yep. You know, and the expectation is that if you, it's not, it's not simply an honor to be listed on the editorial board. It is a commitment yep. to reading for the journal. Exactly. Right? And yep. so, um, you know, you don't, you don't just get to do it because you're fancy. You're actually uh, <laughs> committed to helping us. Yeah. Um, Anne Marie asks if we get many articles, too many, perhaps. Um, you know, there's no such thing as too many, right? I mean, we want people to do the work. Am I overwhelmed by the volume of submissions that come into Modernism and Journey? I am. Yes. So I would say, what do I get? It 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 ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. But you know, I would say three or four articles a week. So that's a good 150 a year, and I can publish eight times. Four, 32 articles a year right 
right and so hence the backlog mm -hmm. yeah i i get far fewer than that i think part partly because of covid um partly for other reasons partly because of the journal it is wolf studies annual um that it um and because it's an annual as well, I think there, there's a weird kind of the calendar of it is also a little different. Like Anne is just because it's a quarterly, it doesn't it doesn't stop. It just keeps going where for part, part of last year, I didn't do much work on the journal at all. And months would go by where we didn't get any submissions. But late summer, early fall hits and suddenly, right. Um, those come in and I, I find myself having to find 25 <laughs> peer reviewers, you know, in a couple of weeks, you know, when I hadn't been used to doing any and when you're, which can be really challenging and for a journal like Wolf Studies Annual because the pool of potential readers, depending on the articles is probably smaller, maybe, maybe mm -hmm. than feminist modernist studies and mo modernism modernity. So it can be challenging, but, um, but far fewer than not, not 150, not even close to that many. I would certainly love to have more um, regularly throughout throughout the year, um, although I may regret that if that actually started to happen. So we've got a question from Laura, uh, Lawrence in the chat. Missy, did you want to answer the, the too many articles thing real quick? I don't have access to that. Right, sorry. Um, okay. But I know that we're always, I, I think right. still a young journal, so there's no such thing right. as too Wanting. many articles. Yeah. <laughs> OK, thank you. Uh, Lawrence asked, following up on what Anne was saying about open access, how is open access impacting your on your journals? In the UK, there is a requirement to publish articles on open access if the author wants to submit them for research impact assessment by funding bodies. Are policies like this putting pressure on journals to offer publishing avenues like modernism, modernity's print plus? Sorry, I didn't mean to be unmiked when I, if I made a groan, I apologize. I'm not groaning at open, open access, I want to be clear, but at um, other kinds of institutional policies. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen seen that. Um, <laughs> I, sorry, I'm laughing at Missy's comment. I hope it's not a bad cat problem, but um, I haven't seen that. But Anne, maybe you'd, you'd be better suited I mean, uh, to I answer. Mean, uh, you know, to what Lauren said, I, I mean, I've said what I have to share. I mean, you know, the, we're based in the united states um the majority of our submitting authors are american are u.s based but um absolutely I, you know i mean print plus really does help with the problem that you're facing and i think that's going to mean that um, modern and modernity continues to be an attractive venue for scholars who are in places where open access is a priority uh, yeah and i would i would say that i think I think at some point it's going to impact WSA since we, you know, scholars in the UK um, have often for the last three decades published their work in, in Wolf Studies Annual and which is not an open access journal. And so that I have a feeling it's going to be something that Pace, and Pace University Press and I may have to have a conversation about at some point to see if there's a way to do something to, to mitigate that and to encourage scholars from the UK to consider WSA for their work. I think so. the teaser article is a really beautiful option. Right. Right. I mean, that, that would be a way, I mean, I mean, I like that idea of the teaser because it's mm -hmm. an inducement to subscribe, right. Or purchase the volume, but it's also, uh, make something accessible. Right. right. And so, right. um, you know, the, I, I I love that as a model. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I love that we publish articles that are exclusive to Print Plus too. But the, the teaser, it seems like a nice, if I were editing something that didn't have an online platform, I would think about that as a on ramp. That's what I'm trying to say. That's useful. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah Amanda pointed out um, FMS's early release, that, a, a really great thing about the, platform for feminist modern studies with Taylor and Francis is that once the editor has a running order um, and can approximate page numbers, we can start uploading articles and they'll appear online before right. the print right. journal. So that gives us a little bit of flexibility. And it's mm -hmm. also really helpful when you have scholars who need something published because they're going on the job market mm -hmm. or going up for tenure. So we can, we can fudge time a little bit. Right.
Any other questions for us? No question too small. We've got another 11 minutes. We're here. Uh, book reviews. I can, I'm stepping down as book review editor for FMS and Lauren Rosenblum will be, Blum will be um, picking that up middle of next year. I've got reviews through January's issue of next year, but I'm, I'm, I'm still the, the point person. So if you have a book that you would like feminist feminist studies to consider reviewing, or if you're interested in reviewing, I think that the, the, the part of being a book review editor I like the least is having to solicit reviewers because people's time is valuable and it's, it's asking a lot. But I'm, I'm so grateful for the people who have been willing to review for me. But when people write me and say, I'd like to review, I'm thrilled. And usually I've got about four or five books that I'd love to get reviewed that, that I will happily uh, suggest for you. I did, I did want to point out, yes, the book review editor of Wolf Studies Annual is also here, Amanda Golden. I a couple reviews. Someone just got excited and wrote it, and we're like, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, that, no, we, we are you both very- idea? Talk to us. Yeah, uh, very eager to, if you are want to review a book or if you have written a book and you you want it to get it, get it on our radar, chances are both of us have heard of it, but it, what it will do is spur us to then you know, especially if you have ideas who you want to have re review it, right? Um, that will get us working to track down a reviewer for your book. And even if it's late in the year, even if it can't go into the next spring's volume, we certainly will still want it. Even if the review is a little delayed, we still will want it reviewed in the annual, so. I do not require a PhD to, to review books for, for FMS. Um, if you, are a good writer and you write a good review, I'm happy to publish it. I, I do um, hesitate to reach out to people who are not affiliated or people who are still dissertating because I respect their time and because I don't think that a book, because a book review doesn't carry the same um, weight on your CV. I don't want to put you in that position to do that if it's if it's gonna detract from other work. But if you wanna uh, volunteer, I, I, I'm, I'm and I'm moved and thrilled. I think I think that's a great point to see. Like, yeah, if you are, are a graduate student or just fresh out of grad school or, you know, um, it might be worth wondering if a book review is the best best use of your best use of your time to do. But certainly Amanda and I would be open to chatting with someone, you know, whatever. Have you have book bloggers reach too. out actually, right. who who have an MA and who aren't affiliated, but who are incredibly well read and right. actively reading and, and writing about books all the time. So I'm always happy to consider right. that. Absolutely. Marsha has a question about, Marsha, do you mean in terms of writing style or do you mean, can you clarify? She writes, the scholarly voice and the scholarly frame of reference have become more varied in recent years. Is there a point? Yes. Yeah. In writing styles, in, in okay. the articles that you read and would consider publishing, do you get things that are unscholarly, not by virtue of a lack of information or simplicity of information, Right. but oh. rather sorry Anne. go ahead no i have a very strong reaction to this because i'm a fan of experimental scholarship and it it does not belong in modernism modernity right so how style is very formal i am editing a journal that's super formal and i am constantly editing out first person and i am not interested in flights of fancy for mm -hmm. this journal in general i love a flight of fancy right i mean the book i'm working on right now is a general interest book it's gonna have some first person moments in it it's gonna have some rather loose connections right i mean there are places for these things mm -hmm. modernism modernity is not that place modernism modernity is a place for very very tightly made scholarly connections among texts. Yeah. 
And is that also the case with modernism or modernity all the way down from the prints? You know, no, the, the blogs the are time. the blogs are loosey goosey and personal and <laughs> funny <laughs> and um, they can be all kinds of different things. Right. So, you know, I mean, read the blogs and read the clusters and you'll see like I was enraged when this happened to me, you know, and sometimes I'm like, whoa, but like that's a lot of information. But, you know, they're, that's fine. So that the, the non-article stuff, go for it, right? And I might say, ooh, dial it back just a notch or two because of the venue. Mm -hmm. But for an article in Modernism and Modernity, like, I want your most stiff upper lip persona. Yeah, I think that that's also generally true of WSA. There have been exceptions in the past, though. And so, uh, you know, I wish I could say that... I would be hard and fast about this, but um, I often think back to Beth, Beth Rigel Doherty's article from volume 10, which was this deeply researched scholarly article about Wolf as a teacher and teaching Wolf that sort of moved back and forth between, um, again, an almost ethnographic account of her own teaching, like teaching Wolf and a course she's teaching that was then interleaved with, right, um, research on Wolf's experience at Morley College, Wolf's uh, pedagogy as she sees it in Wolf's essays. And so that, to me, though, that article had a sort of rich justification for, for what it was doing. And, and, and so, there, so there's a way in which I, I don't think it tips over into unscholarly, even when Beth was moving into those sort of more um, those accounts of, of her own classroom. So it's, it's that's a great example, tough, Ben, yeah. because I really admire that piece and it doesn't yeah. belong in the journal that I currently edit, which doesn't right. mean I don't like right. it. Right. I mean, right. it's just about yep. like, what is your house style? Yep. I think Casey has a good point. That's probably a whole other round table, a discussion about voice and, and right. style. Yeah. So I, I would say that Wolf Studies Annual is maybe, a, yeah a little more open to that, but it will be on a case by case basis, which is maybe not fair, but you know, that is how, you know, that's been the tradition of the journal up, up to now. So, yeah. And I think in the past, Mark has also published pieces that were less scholarly, more sort of commentary on contemporary events, right? Um, and Wolf's relevance for contemporary, then he published them in sort of a section he would call comments or something like that. They wouldn't be articles. Um, they weren't published with the scholarly articles. So he, he's approached this in a number of different ways in the past. That's something that doesn't, um, the, the bulletin of the Great, Brit Great Britain Wolf Society also does things like that, where there'll be comments and snippets and small right. pieces. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Got a teeny tiny bit of time left. Any other, maybe a final question? Going, going, going. Send us your work. Send yes, your please work. do. Yeah, or just if you're curious, if you hear some of this and you just want to talk to, I mean, I'm happy to talk to you or correspond with you about you know, your yes, ideas, absolutely. you know, do you think this would be a good fit for WSA? I'm happy to talk to anybody about that. So, yeah, yeah same, same. So. Well, thanks, everybody. Yeah. This was terrific. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having it's us. A round of applause for our panelists. <laughs> terrific stuff. Very helpful. All right, so we'll see people when. I think we have a half hour break, right? Till the next session. Yes. Right, there's another session. Oh boy. There's another session, yes. <laughs> During another session. Be well, <laughs> little fiends. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Missy and Anne, for joining Thank me on this. This all. was great. It's lovely. It was to good see to see you, you all. Thank you all for being here, and I hope this was helpful. I yeah. hope so, yeah. All right, be well, everyone. Speak soon.